<laughs> so, okay, today we're going to talk about Rabbi Akiva again, but now from a different angle, and that is how we want to see how the rabbis, the colleagues of Rabbi Akiva, how did they perceive his, uh, his involvement in different things. So, Rabbi Akiva, you could say, had a double identity. On one hand, he's a scholar, he's a Talmud Hacham, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, and so on. On the other hand, he's a warrior, he's a freedom fighter, a rebel. Politically involved, very very heavily involved. Like I told you, it was converting people, recruiting them to fight against the Romans. Does he have the time to do it since he was studying? He was, I mean, who knows? It seems like, we'll get, we'll get back to exactly what was the order of his life. How much time he dedicated to this, how much time to that. But now I want to look first to some kind of an, of a, of a, an, an exchange that he had with the other rabbis about uh, Torah issues, not, not war. So here's the, this is the following. In, uh, this is Masech Sanhedrin, Daf Lamit Het Amud Bet. And uh, the Gemara quotes a pasuk from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in, in the Tanakh has uh, interesting visions and dreams and all that. And uh, some of them are not clearly understood. So one of the Psukim in Daniel says, um, He says, I saw, Daniel says, I saw that the chairs or the thrones were set up and the old of days was sitting. Now, Atik Yomin, or the old of days, is a euphemism for God. So Daniel says, I saw that the, the chairs were set up, and God was sitting. So, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor. It doesn't mean literally that Hashem has a chair. But the question that the Gemara raises is, why two? God is one. Why do you say Kor Sevan, which is plural of of uh, Kursaya in, uh, in Aramaic is a chair. And in modern Hebrew, Kursa is an armchair. But it was taken from the Aramaic. So, uh, Rabbi Akiva says, Ehad lo ve'ehad le David. Divrei Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva said, why do, need that? why do you need two chairs? One is for God, and one is for King David, who was the Mashiach, right? אמר לו רבי יוסף, עקיבא, עד מתי אתה עושה שכינה חול? רבי יוסף, who was his, uh, his disciple, his student, calls him by his first name, he says, עקיבא, doesn't call him Rabbi Akiva, he says, are you going to turn, to put God, he says, שכינה is the divine providence, חול means secular, he says, you put God at the same level as a human? This is not right to put God and, and the human at the same level. So no, it, what it means is that there are two thrones for God. One is the throne of justice, of harsh judgment. And one is the throne of tzedakah, of rahamim, loving kindness, mercy. And from here we got the concept that we mentioned in the tefillot, on Rosh Hashanah Kippur, Kisedin, Kiserachamim. That we sometimes, we actually, there's a prayer where, where we say, we ask Hashem to get up from the chair of harsh judgment and move to the chair of uh, loving kindness. So obviously, you know, this is, a, uh, this is, again, a metaphor. It doesn't mean that the Hashem has to sit here or there, but rather that Hashem runs the world in different ways and the way we interpret them <coughs> Some events that happens to us, whatever happens to us, we say, oh, this is Hashem, Hashem judged me, or Hashem treated me harshly. And in other times we say, Hashem showed favor to me, and Hashem was good to me. So, uh, this is what Rabbi Akiva says. No, sorry, not Rabbi Akiva, this is Rabbi Yosei, telling Rabbi Akiva, the two chairs represent two attributes of God, or two ways that Hashem's way are manifested in, in, in our world. The Gemara asks, Kiblamine or lo kiblamine? So did Rabbi Akiva accept this criticism? Did he change his, uh, his thinking of the pasuk or not? The master says, I'll come and hear. The Tanya, Ehad Ladin, Vehad Letzdaka, Divrei Rabbi Akiva. So now the, we have a new quote from Rabbi Akiva where he refers to the pasuk 
that there are two chairs, and he says one is for judgment, one is for loving kindness. This is the, the teaching that he learned from Rabbi Yosef. So it means that he accepted it, and he's okay with it, right? But what happened, we think, when Rabbi Akiva said that? Now it's not his own thing. When he said his own thing, he was attacked, right? Now he's not saying his own thing. He said something that he learned from Rabbi Yosef. So his friends should accept it, right? No, they didn't accept it. Amalu Rabbi Azar bin Azariya, Akiva, Malikha etzel Agada. Says Akiva, you and and uh, moral interpretations or or sermons, you're not made for each other. That's not your department. Okay. In other words, the department of literature is not yours. Malikha etzel Agada, Kalach etzel Negaim va'ahalot. Go away from here. Don't deal with these issues of trying to interpret the Tanakh. Go teach the laws of negaim v'ahalot, leprosy and impurity. So now why is he choosing, why does he choose those two? There are the more, most complicated areas of Jewish law. Negaim v'ahalot, they're very, very complicated. So it seems like he tells him, listen, this is not for you. You, you are more uh, brilliant and, and analytical. This is your department. Um, and and Rabbi Al-Azhar concludes with a different interpretation. He says, "Ehad lekisem ve'ehad lechrafraf kisem lechev alav shrafraf la'adom raglav." This is completely uh, fantastic interpretation, meaning that cannot be literal. Saying that God has two chairs, one to sit on and one to put his feet on, a chair and a stool, and they support with the pasuk Hashemayim kisei ve'aretz adom raglai the the heaven is my seat and the, the earth is my stool. So obviously, again, it's a metaphor, but they more and more take it away from the, from the uh, uh, from realistic interpretation. But what's important is that it seems like no matter what Rabbi Akiva says, they bash him. They don't like what he says. They say, you could, you could, you could teach halakha. Halakha is good for you, but don't deal with moral teachings or with interpreting the Tanakh. What is going on here? Do they have something uh, intrinsic against Rabbi Akiva? The answer is yes, they do. What is the problem that they have with him? Because he was a shepherd once? No. No. They were against him not because he was a shepherd. They were against him because they were not fond of his military campaign. When he went around and he said, we have to fight the Romans and we have to recruit soldiers and we have to go and, and, and defeat them, the other rabbi said, don't do that. It's not going to end well. Because a lot of them realized that what, we did, what the Jews did against the Greeks is not going to work against the Romans. For those who kept fighting against the Romans thought, we defeated the Greeks, the Greeks just gave us autonomy, we could do the same thing with the Romans. What they didn't know was not everybody realized that, that the Greeks were a split empire. They, were, they had a base in Greece, a base in Egypt, and a base in Syria. <clears throat> and the Maccabees dealt only with the Greeks of Syria. And they were one little section that the Greeks had to uh, spend so much time and energy and, and money on, that they eventually they said, you know what, let them be, we'll give them autonomy, we'll, we'll deal with them somehow. The Romans were a central empire. The, the seat of power was in Rome, and they ruled the whole world for one purpose, to collect taxes and to support the central government and the, luxury that they, the, the luxurious lifestyle that they had in Rome. So every single territory that the Romans had was important. And they knew that if they lose one country, even one province, like what they call Yehuda, Everyone else will follow suit. So they couldn't afford to lose anyone. So they poured all their might into the... And people understood that. But Rabbi Akiva thought differently. And he went and recruited people. The rabbis were not fond of that. Remember I told you, we spoke about that, that when Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva said that Rabbi... Uh, that Shimon Bar Kuchva is the Mashiach. His original name was Shimon Bar Kuchva. But Rabbi Akiva changed it to Bar Kuchva. Why did he change it? Because he wanted to allude to the pasuk in in Bamidbar, Darach Kochav Mi Yaakov Vekam Shemet Mi Israel, Umahat Pade Edom Vekarkar Kol Beneshet. The pasuk is in the Vav Bilam. What Bilam says, a star 
will rise from Yaakov. Uh, a comet, a shevet like Shavit, will come from Israel and will destroy all the all the nations of Edom, which is parallel to Rome. So Rabbi Akiva said, "This man Shimon Bar Kosba is the star. He is going to destroy the Romans, and he renamed him from Kosba, Kochova, like the son of the star." The other rabbis look at him and say, Rabbi Akiva, you're going to be pushing daisies before Mashiach comes. You're going to die. So this is not, it's not the Mashiach. We told you that. The way the Gemara tells the story about the death of the students of Rabbi Akiva, that's in Yevamot, is also telling. The Gemara says the following. Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 Talmidim from the city of Gevat to the city of Antipatris, which is near Lod of today. And they all died at one time because they did not Treat each other with respect. What is the point of that? And, and, this, and the Gemara also says, after they died. The Gemara says that Rabbi Akiva put so much effort into getting, recruiting all these soldiers, 24,000. And where were they? From Givat, is it, which is in the north, to Antipatris, which is in the center of Israel. And this is exactly the Roman territory. Meaning that he is recruiting soldiers to fight the Romans. And they all died at one time because of the war. Because they were disrespectful to each other. This is a jab at Rabbi Akiva, because they were telling Rabbi Akiva, what is your most important teaching? Rabbi Akiva is famous for saying a golden rule. Amar Rabbi Akiva, zekral gadol batorah, what is the golden rule of the Torah? Ve'ahavta l'ari'acha kamoch, I love your brethren as you love yourself. The rabbis tell him, look what you did. You got 24,000 soldiers, they're all engaged in battle. Probably they didn't have the spiritual level required for students of Torah. And they don't have even the basic foundation for the Torah that you demand of loving each other. That's why you failed. They told him you failed. And they says, And after this, it was desolation. That was complete destruction after the war. And then, and then Rabbi Akiva went to the rabbis of the south and taught them Torah. And they mentioned five, five names. Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Lazar. Those five students. But they were already scholars. They were already rabbis. Rabbi Akiva just enhanced their Torah. Just uh, fine-tuned it. Right? But it's in another part of Israel. It's in the south where the Romans didn't have control. Meaning he, he, he shifted his tactics. Instead of fighting... A military campaign is finding now in a spiritual campaign. And the Gemara says the military campaign failed, desolation, destruction. The spiritual campaign with five students only, you don't need more than that, succeeded because it's vehem, vehem, yamidu Torah, bot they, were, they were the ones responsible for the continuity of the Torah. So now that we know that, that the rabbis were afraid of uh, Rabbi Akiva's involvement with the military campaign, we could also understand what they're telling him here. The first time that he says that there are two thrones, two chairs, two divine chairs, and one for God and one for King David. They say, what are you doing? What are you trying to say? Who, who is David the Melech? Who is he identified with? With Melech HaMashiach, right? Mashiach means anointed, literally. So they tell him, what, they don't see what he says as just a statement. They read the, the subliminal message. So you're trying to tell people that the time has come for the Mashiach to come and that the Mashiach is at the same level with God. And they also tell him, now indirectly, you're not talking about any general concept of Mashiach. You're talking about your Mashiach. Your candidate who is Shimon Bar Kochva. You, you're using the Psukim, the text of the, of the Tanakh, to promote your agenda. Not right. So they tell him, You're turning the divine into the profane. Not, not just because you put David and, and God on the same level, but because you're using the verses of the Tanakh to promote your own, own, own agenda. Don't do that. So they, they criticize him. That's the first one, Rabbi Yosei. So Rabbi Akiva accepted. He says maybe he doesn't want to to stir a commotion, so he goes and he says, now, this is the new thing I've learned. There's a harsh judgment, there's, a, there's rahamim. Rabbi Al-Azhar hears him, and he doesn't care where Rabbi Akiva took it from. He, he is concerned about one thing, don't let Rabbi Akiva preach. 
no matter what he preaches, no, meaning his sermon, his moral teachings, he says, I'm, I'm concerned about that because he's a, he's a charismatic speaker. He's going to talk to people. He's going to, just as he was able to attract thousands, if not tens of thousands of people to convert to Judaism and join the, the campaign, who knows what he's going to do next. So he tells him, Akiva, Malachi Tzil Haggadah. Don't deliver sermons. Don't be a public speaker. Don't preach to people. Go study halakha. But what halakha he tells him to study, maybe this is also another you know, hidden criticism. He says you have to go to learn the laws of leprosy and the laws of ahalot, impurity. It's not just any impurity. It's the impurity of the dead. So he's telling him two things. The way you deal with what you did to Am Yisrael, you, sh- you, you, you have created... Uh, camps where, like just like the leper is outside the camp, where you created the people are outside the camp now because the way we have the camp which wants to fight against the Romans and the camp who wants to just keep quiet and wait until everything passes. And then the second halakha that he tells him you should go and learn is the halakhot of, of, of death and impurity, telling him, look what you did, you brought so much death with your, with your military campaigns. And shortly after that, Rabbi Akiva died himself. He was executed by the Romans because he kept fighting against them. But it's interesting to see that, you know, what we, today, anyone who studies Gemara, you study Talmud, Rabbi Akiva's name is on every page. And his students, the one mentioned before, Rabbi Yosei, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi, uh, um, Rabbi Uda, they were in charge, each one of them, of editing a different part of the oral law. So he succeeded tremendously in the field of spiritual leadership, whereas whatever he did in terms of the military campaign was a, was a, a, a total failure that caused devastation to Am Yisrael. So we see here in the, in the way the rabbis <coughs> talk to him that, you know, it's, it's, it's already encoded in the, in the Talmudic story, but this was really the dispute against, uh, between them. Is it the time to get up and fight or to keep quiet and wait until the time comes for the Roman Empire itself to crumble and fall, which happened uh, about 200 years later? And then the, the question is, okay, we'll stop here.